All right, um, I'm going to invite everyone to find a seat as it is 9 a.m. and our um, Facebook recording has started. We'll, we'll try this the loser way. The Lord be with you. Works every time. If I could invite the people here to please find a seat as our recording has begun for Facebook and um, Zoom. I'm happy to invite all of you to worship this morning. I'm glad for those of you who have joined us online. Um, today is our fifth Sunday in Easter. And I just have a few announcements with it being the first Sunday of the month. We will be having communion today. Um, so if you are here with us, hopefully you grabbed one of the individual cups and wafers. If not, they're in the back and we'll be happy to get one for you. Um, and hopefully if you've joined us online today, you have some um, available. And if not, please know that you are always being fed by the body and blood of our Christ, um, even if it is not physically. Um, also, uh, I wanted to note that I still have the offering um, uh, basket here for LSSI, um, or if you're joining us online and you'd still like the opportunity to send in an offering for Lutheran Social Services, uh, we ask that you do that this week so that we can mail that to them next week. Um, and then the final, the final announcement I have today is that um, last week we added Dean Schmoey to our prayer list. Dean was, is um, Arlene Glenn's son and Butch Smith's nephew. Um, he did actually die this week, um, very suddenly. And um, so we pray for his family, especially for Arlene um, and her grief, but for the whole Schmoey family. Uh, do we have any other announcements or updates for our prayer list this morning? Okay. Right. Oh, Murray. All right, hang on just one second. Let me get to that page. You said Kelly Burroughs? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, are there any others? All right, then now we turn to our prelude with Connie.
now as it is still Easter season, we continue with our Easter proclamation. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. we do not share in the joy of the resurrection, but are caught in the worries of the world. We confess that we do not always live in the spirit of new life, but remain discontent, grumbling, and anxious. Forgive us for not sharing in the good news. Forgive us when we find it more comfortable to worry and complain than to risk the joy and encouragement of new life in Christ. Call us back to your ways, O oh God, to seek hope and reconciliation, restoration and peace. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Christ is risen. The stone is rolled away, the tomb found empty. We see Christ in every helping hand, in every heartfelt gift, in every choice to restore life in this world. We are called to this new life, a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. You are forgiven. Accept your forgiveness and know that God loves you and desires great joy for your life. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us join together in our prayer of the day. O oh God, you give us your Son as the vine apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts 8, 26 to 40. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Cadence Queen of the Ethiopians in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this ch chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? and he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was, is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The psalm for today is Psalm 22, verses 25 to 31. We will read responsively, please. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they, are, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall pro proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, the Lord has acted. The second reading for today is taken from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, 
and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us, those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Here ends the second reading. All right, um, we're going to try a little something different today since we have a whole crew back in the back. If you guys would like to come or if it's okay with your mom and dad to come up, we can spread out over this whole area and I'm going to move the camera. Sorry, we were on the screen going, woo. All right. There we go. Okay. Yes, it is. You're right. Okay. So I'm going to give you a minute to think while I tell you something. I want you to think if you can come up with something, you don't have to, but if you can, some strange piece of information or fact that you may have learned that you may think I may not know. Okay. So I'm going to tell you mine and then I'll see if any of you have any. Okay, so this is a fact that I just learned the other day. So while there are all kinds of breeds of ducks, they fall into two categories, diving ducks and dabbling ducks. This is what I learned. A diving duck goes completely under the water to get stuff lower down in the lakes, the ponds and stuff. A dabbling duck is the one you think of where it just goes like this, and the back feet and the back end come off. So that was a new fact I learned. I didn't know there were two kinds of ducks, dabbling and diving. All right, so Anna, what fact do you have? The kinds of school of iron bow fact when frogs are made the bathroom, they go down to the school and so they don't put both out in the fall. Okay, very cool. I did not know that about swamps. That's very smart of them, isn't it, to come down out of the trees. Excellent. Jamil, what do you have? I learned a thing from the numbers. A Google is a number. From the second grade. Really? Okay. If somebody gets his number, when uh -huh. it's Google, I have to learn Google's number from the second grade. Okay. Is it a big number? Big number. Okay. Anybody else have any facts they've learned recently they want to share with me? No. No. All right, well, if you have to think one later, if you're sitting in church going, oh, why didn't I tell her this? Please come tell me after church. Because I love to learn new things. Do you know I am in my 40s and I just learned two new things today about the Google and the Swamps. Right? And if I ask everybody here to tell me something I probably don't know, I bet I can learn a bunch more new things. Right? Yeah, because people have all this information that I may not know. So here I am in my 40s. I don't go to school every day like you guys do, but I still learn things. Do you learn things every day? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I said I'm in my 40s. There are some people behind me in their 50s. Do you think they still learn things? Yes. Okay. I do not know that. All right. Let me see. Uh, maybe a few in their 60s. 
I invite those here to rise for the gospel. Our holy gospel today, according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, 
unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Ever since I went to look at what the lessons were this week, that is the question that has run through my head. Not the gospel, but the first reading. What is to prevent me from being baptized? You may have noticed that throughout this Easter season, instead of our regular Old Testament lessons, we are given stories from the book of Acts. To tie into the resurrection of Jesus, we are also given moments of his disciples and their new roles as the bringers of the good news of Christ. So today is Philip's turn. And that is the question he is presented with. What is to prevent me from being baptized? That seems a rather ridiculous question, right? We encourage baptism. We celebrate welcoming someone into the church. Here, you only need to ask to be baptized. Or mostly, in most of our cases, you just need to have your parents bring you to be baptized. But this is a difficult moment for Philip. Right? This is a question he must wrestle with in this new role that he faces. He has been challenged with the words of the Old Testament from Isaiah that we use to describe Jesus' sacrifice. He has now proclaimed the good news about Jesus and his salvation and all that he has done. And now he's being asked to include a new person in the ministry, the church which may seem obvious, but here's the problem. The eunuch doesn't fit into any space that Philip can with certainty say, you belong with Jesus. According to the laws of Deuteronomy, a eunuch is not welcome into the temple to worship. And while this man is wealthy enough to own his own scroll of the book of Isaiah, he is a foreigner. He is not from Israel. He most likely has much darker skin than Philip is used to. And while he obviously has great power and authority, his own chariot, Philip doesn't know anything about his character in any real way. Who is this man? And you have to remember that Philip was raised in an Old Testament temple where laws ruled the day. And there were only certain people and certain ways to be welcomed. In Philip's old life, there was nothing but reasons to prevent that man from being baptized. What is to prevent me from being baptized? I have no doubt that Philip's first thought to that question was everything. Everything prevents you from being a part of the church. But thankfully, he keeps that to himself. What prevents us from being a part of the body of Christ? What do we think prevents others? These are serious questions we must ask ourselves as followers of Christ, especially with the knowledge 
that the church and the world are changing. They are not what they once were. How many times in this year alone have you asked yourself, what will this church look like when this is over? We are in those new moments that Philip and the other disciples faced, trying to figure out how to incorporate all that we once knew to be true about God and the church with all that we know to be true about Jesus along with what we are willing to let go in order to see the love of Jesus travel outside the church. It is a difficult time, but that doesn't mean there aren't new wonders around the corner, that amazing things won't come from it, that the spirit isn't at work. But what is to prevent us from being a part of it? That is a question that deserves some pause, some thought, some honest evaluation on both our part as individuals and the church. And it is a moment where we need to call upon the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that guided Philip and the eunuch because we have all been present, presented with people in our lives that we wonder if we could welcome into this body of Christ called St. Paul's. I know it's easy to say that we'd like more people in the pews or we'd like more people to give the offering. We'd like to see the church live on for decades to come, but do we mean it when those people may be of color? or foreigners, or homeless, or gay, or transgender, or ultra conservative, or ultra liberal, or extra needy, or not understand or accept our liturgy, or perhaps worst of all, offer up changes and challenges to the church. A female pastor that I am good friends with in a Facebook group is struggling this week to keep her call because she used all feminine language for God on Good Shepherd Sunday. And while most of us might say that God is neither male nor female, I wonder what the reaction would be if I used all she's when I talked about God. There are real things that prevent us from being church, from being the body of Christ, from welcoming. And we need to acknowledge those, especially to acknowledge those things that keep us from welcoming ourselves and thereby welcoming others. It's not a surprise that the eunuch questions if he can be baptized rather than simply asking to be. He doesn't see himself as welcome. There's a reason he reads the book of Isaiah because only Isaiah in the Old Testament has anything favorable or welcoming to say about a eunuch. He is searching for a place to belong. And now he's asking Philip if that place could be with Jesus and his followers. What is to prevent me from being baptized? For me, here comes the best part. Philip has no answer because the answer is nothing. While Philip is probably playing all the wrongs and rights in his head, the eunuch simply stops. He goes to the water. With the Holy Spirit, he takes the first step. And with the Holy Spirit, Philip takes the next. And together they realize that God welcomes all. Both Philip and the eunuch are changed. Both let go of a part of who they were. 
and both claim something new as to who they are meant to be. What is to prevent me is met with absolute silence because nothing is meant to prevent anyone from being a part of God's kingdom. And then the Holy Spirit whisks Philip away because there's nothing more needed in that moment. The task is finished. Philip and the eunuch have experienced God. What more could be added to that? Nothing is to prevent him. Nothing is to prevent us, can prevent us or anyone from being a part of the body of Christ. I know, I know at this moment, our heads want to start arguing that point, right? What about murderers, rapists, atheists, abusers, Hitler, etc.? All the bad people we know who are against God. No, nothing can prevent them from being a part of God's kingdom if that is what they want. And there's at least a little catch. You have to want the grace, the forgiveness, the love of God in your life and not everyone does because it changes who you are. The eunuch is a different person when he exits the water. Philip is a different person when he exits the water but nothing prevents anyone from becoming a part of the grace and the love and the forgiveness. Not past wrongs, not the judgments against others, not the harsh words spoken in anger against God, nothing. Anyone who wants to abide does. You knew I'd get the gospel in there somewhere right? Anyone who wants to abide does. It's true. The only thing remotely possible from preventing us of being with God is us. Our choice to not see ourselves as worthy. Our desire to keep sinning or cutting ourselves off. And then we only hurt ourselves because we cannot, should not, and will not keep others from God's love. His vine grows where it chooses and it chooses everyone. God chose Philip and he showed him a new and very unexpected way to welcome people. God chose the eunuch and showed him that he could be the first after Jesus, to proclaim a kingdom that welcomed the outsider. And God chose us to continue that story, the story of welcome, of hope, of growth, not just of those new to the church, but of those who have believed their whole lives. The story that nothing can prevent the Holy Spirit from moving within us and through us to keep this church growing and living and changing and welcoming. Nothing is to prevent God. Amen.
in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now alive in the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer us in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you abide in your church and your church abides in you. Cleanse us by your word and give yourself to the whole church on earth so that it bears fruit and witnesses to your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have created the heavens and the earth. As we wonder at the beauty of creation, may we seek vital connections among all that depends on the earth for life. As the planting of the earth continues, we ask that you watch over farmers and their families, that all may be safe and prosperous. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You rule the nations with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence, that they lead not by fear, but with love for those they are called to serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all those in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, weak, or fearful. We pray for, that, for that, that we and you may provide for the needs of all. We remember especially this day the needs of Dixie, Lee, Marion, Julia, Marilyn, Don, Tim, Pat, Marcia, Doug, John, Pam, Heidi, Judy, Steve, Pat, Greg, Pastor Lisa, David, Joanne, Jeff, Barry, Mike, Buddy, Bonnie, Landon, Kelly, the Schmoey family, and all those who rest in our hearts and our minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You gather us with all the saints by the power of your spirit. We remember especially this morning your Saint Dean. With them, may our hearts live forever in your keeping. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Holy are you, God of every day, creator of all that is good and blessed is Jesus Christ, the bright morning star who entered into the shadows of hell to lead us into hope's light. He is the beloved of your heart and he embraced our sins so that we could be forgiven. He is glory beyond imagination and he welcomed death so that we could enter life eternal. He is the savior of the world, and he gave himself for us so that we might live for you and for others. 
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for his disciples to drink, saying, Take and drink. This is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. It is here at this table, resurrecting God, that we are fed by your love. As you pour out your spirit upon the bread and the cup, fill us with the spirit of Jesus so that we may go forth to be your people. Feed us with the bread of heaven so that we can fill the hunger of the world. Touch our lips with salvation's cup so that we can proclaim the good news of this day to everyone we meet. And when the final morning comes, when we are united with all the saints gathered around heaven's table, we will lift our voices to you, almighty God, heavenly Father, to whom be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, if you are joining, you may be seated. If you are joining us for the first time today um, and you have the individual communion, you'll notice that one layer is the wafer and then there's a second layer for the wine. Um, and while you take that, I'm gonna come around and bless our um, non-communers in the church. Now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life now and forever. Amen. Now may the Father who created you sustain you, the Son who died for you live in you, and the Spirit who burns in you breathe in you anew. Amen.
Everybody notice he's taller than me now? Always happens. The confirmation kids shoot up past me. Oh, now let us go in peace and serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. We turn to our prelude or post -lead. Blessed week, and I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Leave us in the seat.